This is the Lex Free Podcast, where we abridge the Lex Podcast with love by replacing everything Lex says with a pleasant guitar strum. Enjoy. So free speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of belief, freedom to participate in your government, the freedom to have privacy, the freedom to own things, property rights. These are all basic, fundamental, negative rights, what we call them. These are the basic fundamental human freedoms. What does negative rights mean? Negative rights are liberties and positive rights are entitlements. So after World War II, when the UN came together, it was largely a compromise between the communist Soviet Union and the you know, free United States, right? So the US had uh, on its side of the UN Declaration of Human Rights, uh, a bunch of li liberties, essentially, things like free speech freedom of association, freedom of assembly. The Soviets wanted entitlements, uh, like the right to work, the right to have housing, the right to water, the right to a vacation. So if you actually read the UN Declaration for Human Rights, it's a negotiation between the Soviets and the Americans. Later, uh, there was another document in the 70s released called the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And this is what HRF uses as its sort of like lodestar, um, its founding document. And this is like essentially an international agreement on the negative rights. Those are the things we choose to focus on because essentially authoritarian regimes can commit fraud and claim they're giving the, the positive rights, the entitlements, without having any of the negative liberties. And they can do that because they don't have any like free speech or press freedom. Um, when you when you take people's basic fundamental freedoms away, it's quite easy to make like a Potemkin village and pretend that there's the entitlements and that we have good uh, health care. And, you know, it's the same sort of thing that authoritarians have done for decades, uh, Cuba and Venezuela and, and the Soviet Union. The opposition leader of Malaysia, Anwar Ibrahim, he once told me uh, the, the funny joke that, you know, in my country, we have freedom of speech, but we don't have freedom after speech. <laughs> so yeah, they, they can absolutely manipulate whatever they want. But I've done research into socioeconomic data. And I guess what I'm telling you is that authoritarian regimes, which make up 53% uh, of the world's population across 95 countries, um, about 4.3 billion people, those who live under those regimes are subject to uh, massive fraud when it comes to things like literacy rates, um, life expectancy, um, any sort of socioeconomic data, economic growth. They can do this because there's no free press. Um, so for us at the Human Rights Foundation and for people like me, we believe that the negative rights, the liberties, the things that are in, for example, uh, the Bill of Rights in the US Constitution, these things are the table. And then we can build on top of that. We can build the rest of our societies on top of that. The freest countries in the world have both the negative liberties and the entitlements, like Norway, for example. But there's a big difference between Norway and North Korea. In North Korea, they only claim to have the entitlements and they definitely don't have the liberties. <laughs> Yeah, I think, I think free speech is probably the most fundamental. It's probably why the founders chose to make it into the First Amendment. Um, a lot of things are downstream from there. Property rights are also very, very important. Um, obviously, we've seen the, the toll of violent redistributionism, you know, in over the last hundred years, uh, whether it was uh, Lenin or Stalin or Mao uh, or other regimes and everywhere from Ethiopia to colonial, colonialists everywhere to, to North Korea. It's not a pretty legacy. There is a Soviet dissident named Natan Sharansky who um, survived uh, the regime. And he wrote a book uh, in which his thesis was essentially the way that you can define a free society is through something called the town square test. Can you go to a public space where you live and criticize your ruler loudly um, without fear of ret retribution. If you can do that, you have, you have free speech. I think that's a pretty good litmus test. Hmm. Um, most people in this world cannot do that. If you live in Havana, if you live in Moscow, if you live in Beijing, uh, you cannot do that. And, and that's not a free society. Uh, in Austin, Texas, in Boston, Massachusetts, in London, in Santiago, Chile, in Tokyo, Japan, in many democracies, you can do that. And I think that that's a really helpful basic sort of litmus test. <laughs> I 
I think it ends poorly when the state tries to restrict speech. Um, I think that's kind of how I would define censorship. I think censorship and deplatforming are two different things. Uh, private companies, um, you know, they get to make up their own rules about what's allowed on their platforms. And I think that's very different from a government with guns and an army restricting the speech of its citizens with threats of violence. These things are different for me. Yeah, it's a bit of a generalization, but Alex Jones would be in prison or dead if he were in North Korea or in yeah. Cuba or in Russia or in China. That he, that the authorities would not tolerate him to do what he did. And here he can kind of do what he wants. He's encountering some resistance in the marketplace of ideas, uh, large organizations, corporations, and a lot of public sentiment uh, in different parts of our country don't like him. <laughs> They're doing their best to drown his, out his voice. But that's very different from a, a violent threat of censorship from the state. And that's what we study. That's what I study are these, you know, what is the state doing? That's kind of paramount for, for me. Yeah, so I've been working for HRF since 2007. Um, we are a charity, a nonprofit a 501c3 based in New York. And our mission is to promote and protect individual rights and freedoms in authoritarian societies around the world. So again, we, we define about 95 countries as authoritarian, meaning it's either a one party state or opposition politicians are outlawed or persecuted. There's no real free speech. There's no press freedom. There's no independent judiciary. There really aren't checks and balances. And even trying to create like a human rights organization uh, or like an environmental group uh, would, would be illegal. Um, and the majority of the world's population lives in that environment. That's very important. Sure. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, maybe you can mention if you remember. The number of people who are refugees, the number of people who suffer from natural disasters, the number of people who live under abject poverty, the number of people who don't have access to clean drinking water, all of these are dwarfed by the number of people who live under authoritarianism. And yet it's not something that we talk about a lot because people are mercantilist and the powers that be are happy to sacrifice freedoms and privacy for money. We live in a profit-seeking world. To get evidence of this, take a look at the list of sponsors of the upcoming Olympics in, in, in China, where the CCP is currently committing genocide against the weaker population. Or look at the number of people and the famous investors who went to Saudi Arabia a couple months ago for the Davos in the desert. I mean, Ray Dalio was there, all kinds of people were there. And, or at least they were invited and they said they were going to go. And this is a government that uh, at the time was torturing a female activist who just wanted to drive a car. This is a government that had murdered Jamal Khashoggi uh, uh, in a brutal fashion uh, just a couple years earlier. So, I mean, at the end of the day, when, when it comes down to brass tacks, I mean, you know, the powers that be, the, even the, f the free countries are led by people um, who are very, very happy to, to sacrifice all these pretty words about human rights when it, when it comes down to profits, unfortunately. Look, I think that at the end of the day, like free trade is actually really good. Um, and you can just look at France and Germany as an example of, of how like a capitalist structure would develop. If you have two capitalist actors, they're very unlikely to fight each other. There's very unlikely to be violence, right? These are two countries which basically murdered some large percentage of each other's male population three times in a hundred years in three different wars, right? And now today, war is like unthinkable. And a lot of that is because of increased collaboration, increased trade. So when you have two capitalist actors, they act in a very productive way with each other. Um, but as soon as you introduce an authoritarian actor, you know, all, all bets are off. So I think what you have is a conflict between capitalist actors and authoritarian actors. And at the end of the day, people need to, yes, have more than just capitalist intentions. In, in, in the geopolitical level I'm talking about, they need to actually take a stand for principles. Otherwise you have athletes and businesses and governments that are all too happy to, to do business with the Chinese Communist Party, for example, right now. I think that there is a little more than just kind of the pure, um, the pure profit, yes. There's a couple good litmus tests. 
One is actually, can you have a gay pride parade? <laughs> That's a good. I'm serious. It actually lines up perfectly. It doesn't matter what religion the dictatorship is. Yeah. They don't like minor. They don't like minorities, and they love to scapegoat whether it's gays or religious minorities, etc. So it lines up pretty well. That's really interesting. If you cannot have a gay pride parade in your country because you're fearful that you're going to get the crap kicked out of you, probably live in an authoritarian regime. Um, fascism scapegoat. scapegoats minorities. There's an other, that you yeah. create an other group and then you... Uh, Whether, yeah, I mean, Uganda is a great example of this, but so is Saudi Arabia, so is China. Um, I mean... So is Cuba. I mean, these are all regimes which demonize uh, the you know LGBT communities. Um, well, denial is the most powerful form of demonization. I mean, this is what the Iranian dictatorship does. A few years ago, when Ahmadinejad, who was who was then sort of the de facto leader, he came to Columbia University and he tried to give a speech, which you can look up, and he tried to claim that there were no gays in, in Iran. And that's the most powerful form of demonization is trying to just wipe out your outer existence. There's other good litmus tests too. Um, you know, for, for example, you, you can think about comedy. Um, can you make money making fun of your government on television? If you cannot, you live in a dictatorship most likely. I mean, it's shocking to people that I work with who live in dictatorships when I tell them that not only are comedians uh, able to safely make fun of our government, but they get paid very well to do so. That's a hallmark of a free society. So that's another good litmus test. Hear that, Tim Dillon? You should go to North Korea. Check it out. Yeah, and, and look, there are tons <laughs> of flaws with democracies. These are really uh, good tests, by the, the way. The United States is a deeply flawed country in many ways. Our prison system is a disaster. Um, there's, you know, a horrible war on drugs. We committed a grievous uh, crime, in my opinion, by invading Iraq. Like, we did a lot of problematic things, but our core architecture is still an open society. Um, the people who criticize the U.S. the most usually live within it. Mm -hmm. And if they were to move to a different country and try to use that criticism against their new rulers, they wouldn't fare so well. So whether it's Chomsky um, or whomever, if they were to go to Cuba and live in Cuba and try to criticize Cuba like they do America, it wouldn't last very long. So I think what's important to distinguish between open societies and closed ones, or like, like free societies and authoritarian regimes, it doesn't mean that your government's gonna be good all the time. What it means is that the citizens have a way to push for reform, have a way to hold the rulers accountable. So even if you don't like what the US government does, whether it was under Biden or Trump or Obama or Bush, we can rotate them through voting. And we have an independent Supreme Court um, that rotates over time. And we have people that we can elect directly to serve our interests. And then there's like a free press and there's lobbyists and all kinds of people that jostle for power. So there's a separation of powers. And I like to think about a free society really as like at the bottom of the, the foundation of the pyramid really would be free speech. And then you would have civil society, like, for example, um, human rights organizations, environmental groups, stamp collectors, athletes, any groups that come together, you know, beyond the government's sort of strict instruction. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, at the third level, you have separation of powers. Again, what I'm describing. Um, so authoritarian regimes don't really have any of these layers to them, right? And then at the top, then you put elections. But the elections are meaningless if you don't have the foundation below. Every dictator gets elected. Kim Jong-un gets elected. He's the only person on the ballot. Every dictator from Hitler to, to Chavez, they all got elected. Elections on their own mean literally nothing. You have to have these other layers beneath to actually be an open and free society. I think it's very important for people to understand. Yeah, there's like a ladder that you climb, the election, and you pull the ladder up and then no one else can climb up. Yeah. This sadly you know, happened in Egypt and it was quite predictable after Mubarak was ousted after the Arab Spring, you know, Morsi came in and it, it looked like, you know, the Muslim Brotherhood was not really going to be very democratic. Um, but it didn't really matter because then the military came back and now we have Sisi, who's even worse than Mubarak. So a lot of times in these regimes, unfortunately, it's very difficult for people to build that democratic society afterwards. Um, some people have told me that 
when you live in a totalitarian or an authoritarian regime, it's kind of like a political desert. What grows in the desert? Scorpions and cacti, right? So basically people with very extreme views because you as an authoritarian ruler, your best method for control is to get rid of the moderates. You have to crush the moderates. That's very important. You want to have the only opposition to you be extremists. That way, when you go and have negotiations with the United States, you can kind of hold up the terrorists or whomever, the extremists, and say, it's either us or them, right? And then the realists who run the U.S. government are going to choose you. And that's why one of the reasons why the U.S. government has supported so many dictators around the world over the last few decades. We started with authoritarianism or autocracy, right? Ruled by one or, or a small group oligarchy. And... All humans lived under this structure for, you know, the, the virtual, you know, bulk of all human existence. Only until pretty recently did we start having actual democracy. Uh, the idea that we should be ruled by rules, not by rulers, very powerful. Um, invented in many places across the world. Uh, Western Africa had this idea, and so did the ancient Greeks. Um, and they started to implement it. Although, as most know, we didn't have full democracy for a long, long time because it was only property owners or only men, or only per people of a certain race. But this idea that, that we can like rotate our rulers and that we could be ruled by rules is extremely powerful. And it really, like for me, the ideas behind this, um, I think unlocked uh, a lot of the industrial revolution, these small personal freedoms that were allowed in some countries, but not others. And they unlocked a lot of the scientific innovation over the last few hundred years. Um, and to me, there's like a really straight line between like scientific inquiry, free speech, freedoms, and then more prosperity and more effectiveness a, 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 as a civilization. So I, I think that democracy, you know, ruled by the people is definitely an upgrade from autocracy or oligarchy, you know, which would be ruled by, by one or, or ruled by a small group. And I think that the, the democratic revolution has been an incredible thing for our world. Uh, and, and it's, it's. You know, you could do half class full, half class empty. The half class full is that almost half the world lives under democracy. Like that, that's an incredible achievement. <laughs> yeah, we're, can... we're a little, little bit of a, um, a stalemate here. Uh, democracies really blossomed uh, between World War II and the year 2000, especially in the 80s and 90s. You had an incredible wave of fall, you know, where, where many, many authoritarian regimes fell and were replaced by democracies. I think around 20, 2015, the, the acceleration kind of came to a standstill a little bit. Um, there's some good news in some countries and there's bad news in others. Um, like in the last 10 years, you've had, for example, the Philippines has gone backwards. Um, Thailand has gone backwards. Bangladesh has gone backwards. Turkey has gone backwards. That's, that's like a half billion people right there. So you've had some positives, um, like, you know, th there was positive movement forward in Armenia, Malaysia, some other countries. Um, but we're, we're kind of at a stalemate right now. And what most people fear them about where we are right now, who, who I respect is what is the digital transformation of the world due to this like progress of democracy uh, or of open societies? And, and that's what concerns me the most. I've seen both. In my work at HRF, I started by helping to put together backpacks with foreign information that we sent to the Cuban underground library movement. So in Cuba, you know, to own a book at the time, you had to get, have the government's permission. There was very little internet penetration, okay? So we would send in movies, you know, V for Vendetta dubbed into Spanish, and people would sit <laughs> inside great. their homes, yeah. and they'd watch it, and they would answer questions with each other, and it was very powerful. And then after that, I worked with people inside North Korea. We would send in flash drives. We have this program called Flash Drives for Freedom. We've sent over 100,000 flash drives in our work into North Korea, a country of about 25 million people. That's a lot, it's a big big difference. That's you know many, many millions of hours of films, books, movies, et cetera. So I've seen the power that technology can have where you know in the 60s and 70s, you know, to get, to break an information blockade, you had to like send in crates of books into a communist country. So now all of a sudden you can send the entire contents of what was once the Library of Alexandria on something the size of your, your thumbnail. Like that's remarkable. So obviously I've seen the positives of technology and we'll certainly get into Bitcoin, but I'm, you know, very concerned about essentially big data analysis, like what people call AI or general, you know, specific, you know, specific kinds of AI. Like 
very concerning. I think these are very authoritarian. I mean, it's very hard to make a case that AI is going to be good for human rights. Very difficult, in my opinion. It may be good for health. It may be good for uh, our efforts to protect the planet. It may be good for a lot of scientific things. I find it very hard to believe it'll be good for civil liberties. Sounds like to me you're describing encryption, or, or at least the, the ability to encrypt, the ability to use uh, digital keys to secure your property. And I, I, that to me is a very powerful uh, individual right, force for individual rights, very powerful. And it's what's, what animates Bitcoin ultimately, which, which we'll get into. But for me, at least the way I look at it today in 2021, the threat from big data analysis uh, used by governments and authoritarian regimes is terrifying. I mean, to actually see what the Chinese Communist Party is doing, where they have hundreds of millions of cameras overseeing society, cameras that can tell who's a Uyghur and who's a Han, that to me is terrifying. And, and everything is sorted instantly. There are, there are supercomputers that are built in Urumqi, in, in Xinjiang, for this explicit purpose. And, you know, it allows the government to quickly sort and basically commit genocide a lot faster. And it's really scary. So I, I do agree, and I've seen personally how powerful technology can be as a force for freedom. Um, but I'm, I'm very, very worried about big data analysis in the hands of government. Yeah, I'll I mean, the practical ideas. application in Xinjiang, which is a territory the size of Alaska, uh, where a large percentage of the population has been put into prison camps. Um, the current issue of The New Yorker has an absolutely harrowing uh, essay that, that tells the story of one such woman who in, I believe, 20, 2017 got sucked into one of these camps and it took her a year or, or more to get out. Um, and, and she's talking about how in each home in Xinjiang, each home has a QR code on it that the police can scan and get like a quick instant download of who lives there. Uh, each car has, you know, like a scannable code. Um, every, every single person has their DNA taken and the DNA is being sifted through and analyzed by algorithms. So this is like the Chinese government's laboratory for how can we use technology to uh, oppress. It's like sort of like digital Leninism. And that to me is one of the biggest uh, risks in our world today, and it's not talked about enough. That's interesting. So technology is basically enables the automation of oppression. Absolutely. So like... But to, to define technology, big data analysis and, you know, maybe specific AI, et cetera, does. But encryption allows us to fight back. It's very important people understand we have tools to fight back. The in, You know, Big Brother can only grow if it can feed on your data. If it mm -hmm. can't get your data, it can't grow. Right. So you have to willingly give up stuff to the cloud um, for this monster to grow. And we can, we can, we can like make the monster hungry and shrink it if we give it less data. And I think that's where I would agree with you in terms of like wanting to empower people to be able to do stuff on their own terms mm -hmm. in a sovereign way. And yeah, maybe you're you're kind of thinking like the personal assistant who helps out Tony Stark or something like that. Mm -hmm. And and that's, yeah, as long as there's no back doors and that's a sovereign thing that you've popped up and created and you have the keys to, absolutely. But practically speaking, if we're talking about the world today as is, we need to be concerned about the way that authoritarian regimes are using big data analysis and they're gonna buy this software and this equipment from the Chinese government. They're already doing it. Street level surveillance has already been purchased by governments everywhere from Latin America to Sub-Saharan Africa to, to the heart of Europe. Um, there's been huge scandals in Britain over their purchase of Chinese surveillance technology. Um, part of the Chinese government's Belt and Road campaign, uh, which is to basically to build the infrastructure of this century and to be in control of it, is this idea, part of that idea is to, is to ship out and install surveillance technology, um, both at the telecom level and at the surveillance level across dozens of countries around the world and have that back door, right? There's this national security law in China, which states that like companies that are Chinese, which are abroad, are mandated to send data back to Beijing, right? So they are building this like huge global surveillance state. And again, not talked about enough. You should go Google and, and research the Belt and Road. I think it's very important that we confront this. It's a free society versus a fear society. Yeah, fear society. And look, people are, it's all about the trade-offs you make in your daily life. Like living more privately with more freedom is less convenient. You trade 
freedom and privacy for convenience and comfort and speed. Absolutely. It's an engineering decision in everything that you do. Um, in the West, we, in, in advanced democracies, we have not necessarily personally seen the results of that trade-off because we we live in these free societies that have these checks and balances and freedoms. But as soon as you step into an authoritarian state and you make those trade-offs, your life you know immediately becomes more, more restrictive. And, and what people are worried about is that even in advanced uh, economies, market democracies, et cetera, the people are worried that they might not survive the, the, the great social digital transformation. Um, you know, look at what the NSA is capable of doing. I mean, for now, it's not that big of a problem because we still have free speech. Um, but it's deeply concerning what Snowden revealed. And it's a nice reminder <laughs> that we need to be focused on on privacy and encryption and on helping users become more more sovereign, regardless of where you live. It's kind of like a crutch to live in a free society. Like, you know, it's almost like a free lunch in a way. Um, you're not going to be sent to a prison camp because of the color of your skin or your beliefs or what you say about the government. Um, and you're very lucky. Uh, again, most people do live in a society where you you can be persecuted for those things. And I feel like, especially in America, we we forget that. We're, we're, we're distanced from that really strong reality, you know? important. I, I, I think the two lessons from Snowden are A, ma the, the Patriot Act and the war on terror and mass surveillance are not necessary for our democracy and for our freedoms. Um, this was a false choice. We never had to sacrifice them to be safer. Um, and, and we've seen that. Government has spent hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars on these like surveillance programs that in, you can read about have ana amounted to very little, except for tremendous bureaucratic waste and the you know, you know, erosion of our freedoms. Um, but at the same time, we, we need to practice more privacy. And the dramatic increase in the usage of Signal, for example, has been really, really great to see. It's, it's fantastic that tens of millions of people are downloading Signal and using it. Um, you should try to be onboarding more and more of your conversations onto Signal, for example, where governments can't see what you're saying. Maybe they can see the metadata. Maybe they can see that you sent your phone number, sent a message to someone else's phone number at this time but they can't see what's inside. So using encryption in your life is very, very important. That's a good starting point. I would say that's kind of step A. Yeah, I think we can keep it simple for the purposes of this conversation. You have politics, information, and money. Those are the three things I would encourage us to focus on. In yeah. politics, yes, someone invented democracy. I mean, whether it was the Greeks, um, or the West Africans, or many others around the world, around the same time invented this idea that we should be ruled by uh, rules and not by rulers, right? Yeah. Um, and that has evolved dramatically, right? And now you, and then you have information. Information also used to be highly centralized, right? You know, think about how rich you had to be to gain access to a library before the printing press, or, you know, how much money you had to have, or how close to the king or the, you know, feudal lord you had to be to be able to have that ability. But now, you know, the majority of the world, billions of people have access to all information in their pocket and they can set up an account on social media and get their word out. So not only politics, but information has been dramatically decentralized. Um, and I would say that encrypted messaging is kind of a corollary to that second innovation in as much as now people are like more effortlessly, like Signal is a lot easier to use than PGP, for example. Mm -hmm they're more easily able to practice privacy when it comes to having private messages uh, globally. Um, these are all good things and we need to keep pushing. And I think money is like, honestly, maybe the most important piece. And that's why I spent so much time thinking about Bitcoin. I have witnessed money be peripheralized. Take, take, it has taken a back seat in the human rights conversation. The idea of currency, who makes the money, who makes the rules, who issues it, who sets the interest rates, all these things, it is not on the menu of human rights activists. If you just do like a systematic study of like the human rights discourse over the last several decades, money is not there. It's also not really taught in schools. Like children don't really learn about money. Where does it come from? It's it's kind of hidden from, from, our, from a lot of our discourse. Um, only really when I got into Bitcoin did I start learning more about money. Um, I spent 10 years at the Human Rights Foundation 
and we we did all kinds of programs around the world. We convened Oslo Freedom Forums in different places, and I got to meet hundreds of dissidents. And very rarely did they ever speak about currency or bank accounts or moving money from one place to another. But when I started asking them, they always had amazing stories about money, always. I mean, my friend Ivan Mawire, who um, started the This Flag movement in Zimbabwe, which ended up toppling Robert Mugabe, when I asked him to come to San Francisco to give a talk about hyperinflation, which he lived through, he said, no one's ever asked me to do that before, but I'll come. And he came. This was about three years ago. And the first thing he did when he got on the stage is he opened up a shirt and he brought out a necklace that had the 1980 Zimbabwean dollar on it. And he said, we in the activist community wear this as a symbol of where our country used to be because the Zimbabwean dollar used to be worth two British pounds. And then, of course, over the next two and a half decades of economic mismanagement, and corruption by Mugabe, it got inflated out of existence, right? You've seen those like $100 trillion Zimbabwean notes. Mm -hmm. um, so he had to live through that, which was terrible and crushing. But he, you know, is an expert on money. If you actually talk to human rights activists about money, they know a lot about money. They're just not usually asked to talk about it. So, you know, for me, um, money, mon you know, when I study money or look at money, it's really about control. You know, who who is creating it? And how much does the population know about the creation of that money? And when it comes to Bitcoin, it's really the people's money. Like there is no shadowy force in charge of it. We all know the rules. We all know how it's going to get minted and how it's going to get printed. And, you know, that information is out there for everybody to see. And there's no like special group of rules for one group of people or another group. You know, a billionaire and a refugee are the same in the eyes of the protocol. This is a rather revolutionary concept. And in the same way that democracy allowed us to decentralize politics and have checks and balances, and in the same way that the internet is this culmination of technologies that allowed us to decentralize information, access to and, and control over it, Bitcoin, you know, decentralizes money. I mean, no longer, again, is there one group of people who can just change it arbitrarily. We're all on the same playing field. And I think that that is a tremendous innovation. So we talked about authoritarianism and we talked about the surveillance state. To me, Bitcoin has two kind of key mechanisms through which it can help us. Number one, uh, it's a sovereign savings account. It's debasement proof, meaning the government cannot print more whenever they want. This is very, very different from fiat currency, which by its very name, its very nature, can be issued on sort of demand, right, by the rulers. And while I live in a country where the rulers do a reasonable job of managing the money, most people aren't so lucky. So only 13% of humans in the world live in a country that's a liberal democracy with property rights and has what we call a reserve currency, meaning a currency so stable and desirable that other countries save in it at the central bank level, right? You basically have the US, the UK, Australia, Switzerland, the Euro, and Canada. I mean, those are like reserve currencies. And these are liberal democracies where people have reasonable guarantees over property rights. Everybody else either lives under like a weaker currency or an authoritarian regime. That's 87% of the world's population, almost 7 billion people. So for them, a sovereign savings account that's permissionless, meaning you don't have to have ID to use it, is a big, big deal. And a lot of people talk about Zimbabwe or Venezuela as some like isolated cases. Oh, well, you know, hyperinflation only happens in, in those two countries. Um, I actually did some research into this and there's about one point, uh, over, a, you know, close to 1.3 billion people who live under double or triple digit inflation. This is not an isolated instance. We're talking huge countries, Nigeria, 200 million people, 15% inflation, Turkey, 15% inflation for hundred million people, Argentina, 40% inflation for a country of 45 million people. Um, so you can go down the list. There's about 35 countries where like people's earnings, their wages um, are literally disappearing in front of their eyes over a matter of weeks or months against things like the dollar, or gold, or real estate, right? So this is a huge issue. It absolutely is a human rights issue for me. I mean, when it comes to your time and energy, having control over that or having it stolen from you, I think this is pretty clear. And Bitcoin is like an immediate, uh, low cost, easily accessible solution for people. And I've learned this not from my own assumptions, but by talking to people, by interviewing dozens of people, whether it's in Sudan, which currently has triple digit inflation, um, or uh, people who've escaped from Syria, 
who have used Bitcoin to get their wealth out of the country and then also to make payments back to people inside um, or Venezuela or elsewhere. It's very, very powerful. Yeah, so again, we have one clear use case, which is a sovereign savings account that you can control, right? The other use, use case is an unstoppable payments network. This is very important for people who live behind, for example, sanctions. Like the U.S. like basically um, weaponizes the dollar and it like sanctions different countries. And instead of sanctioning like a handful of rulers, for example, which I would support, this is like a Magnitsky or smart sanctions. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we'll just say, we're just gonna shut off this whole country. So the people embargo. suffer. Cuba or Iran are good examples. Yeah. Average people suffer, right? So people in those two countries I just mentioned, Cuba, Iran, or even Palestine, which is off, also sort of like blockaded by the Israelis. So you have Cuba, Iran, Palestine are three good examples where people inside all three of those countries now are using Bitcoin to do commerce, do their business, send money back and forth. So it's sanction families. resistant. Sanctions resistant. It does not get stopped by sanctions, right? Um, and also it's, again, remittances are extortionate. I mean, the average remittance, you know, costs uh, has, has a high fee, takes several days. If your family is in Ghana or something like that, or Nigeria, and you live in the United States, it can take time to use Western Union. Um, sometimes, you know, oh, it gets paused, it gets lost, there's issues, you have to deal with customer service. Screw that. I mean, you know, if the person has a cell phone, which increasingly is the case. I mean, by the end of next year, uh, more than five or six billion people, depending on different estimates, will have smartphones, basically, by the end of 2022. Uh, we're talking like the vast majority of humans will have access to smartphones. They can all have sovereign Bitcoin wallets. And there's even ways to access Bitcoin without the internet. Um, but I mean, we can get into that. There's like hardware wallets and so on. What do you mean by sovereign uh, Bitcoin wallet? You know, most users today are using Bitcoin in a, in a custodial manner. So this is kind of like having a bank account um, where you have a deposit uh, account at a bank, right? So you, you have a claim, right? You go to the bank and they have some of your money and you take it out, right? You, with an ATM. So uh, what I would call uh, non-custodial Bitcoin use would be similar to withdrawing cash from an ATM. You have it, it's a bearer instrument, okay? So when bearer I, instrument. it's what it's called, it's a bearer instrument. No, I know, I'm, so, I apologize. I'm outside this community, it just sounds funny. No, no, it's, yeah. So like a bearer it's instrument good. would be like a bar of gold or yes. um, a, a bank note or Bitcoin that you control, meaning you have the seed phrase, right? Which for the listeners essentially is 12 to 24 English words that you write down on a piece of paper. Yeah. That's your like password to get into your Bitcoin account. Mm -hmm. And that gives you that bare instrument quality, right? But unfortunately, most users uh, still use Bitcoin in a custodial way, meaning they buy it on Coinbase. So Coinbase or Square you or would, something like that. You would put into into the- Custodial. Into the custodial category it's like a, Bitcoin like a bank. bank. Yeah. And look, the good news is you can withdraw to your own control. And in the Bitcoin community, we try to teach this idea that it's not your keys, not your coins. In the same way that if you deposit your money at the bank, you might not get it back. I mean, it's low likelihood, but it's, but it's very possible. Uh, same thing in Bitcoin. Like if you wanna get the full experience, you wanna actually custody your own Bitcoin. You wanna, you wanna put it, whether it's on an open source software wallet, like the blue wallet is a good one for people to check out, um, or a hardware wallet like cold card, for example. There's different ways to do this. Um, but essentially like around the world, uh, people are innovating. Like, don't think so low of, of your fellow man. You know what I mean? Like people are able to figure this out. You know, I get a lot of flack from people saying, oh, Bitcoin's so hard to use. I read this article in the New York Times saying this guy in Silicon Valley lost all of his Bitcoin. That's because he was a moron and didn't care about it. This guy lost all this Bitcoin because it wasn't worth much 10 years ago. And he, you know, he forgot the password. But if you're like receiving your remittance from a family member, you're, you're not going, going to, to lose the password, right? <laughs> Oh, I mean, I would United say States. the capital of Bitcoin could easily be Lagos and not San Francisco yes. in terms of users, in terms of people using it. And again, the two use cases as a savings account and as an unstoppable payment rail. These are the two ones that, that you should really think about. This yeah. is how people are using it today. Now, when it comes to, could it possibly be adopted by like a sufficient majority of the population? I say yes. And it's very similar to the way the mobile phone spread. At, at the beginning, the cell phone was only for rich people. It was only for the elite. It was huge. It didn't work very well. The interface sucked. It was clunky. Over time, it got smaller and smaller and cheaper and cheaper and easier to use and easier to use. And today, everyone benefits. 
So you're going to watch a similar technology upgrade process with Bitcoin. Already in the last 10 years, Bitcoin has gotten so much easier to use. I mean, there are now mobile wallets that are so slick. There's one called Moon, M-U-U-N wallet mm -hmm. from a team in Argentina. And these, these, these guys created it because they saw their own currency devalued like three times in the last 20 years. And they've had a hell of a time trying to get their money back and forth from different countries. So they were like, let's make this easy for people. Um, again, you know, this is... This is the people's money. This is this is something that cannot be controlled by by governments or corporations, and th that makes it very powerful. And I, I think it's actually quite exciting to be here at, in the adoption phase. Okay. When you say overtake, um, what do you mean? What do you mean overtake? Do you mean number of users? Do you mean a, a price per coin? No. I mean, Bitcoin is the innovation. The innovation is in having the decentralized mint. No one can change the monetary policy. Everything else is downstream from there. In Bitcoin, the meme would be 21 million. There's never going to be any more than 21 million. Every other cryptocurrency either has an inflationary policy, meaning there's going to continue to be more and more of it over time, or its monetary policy can be changed by a small group of people. This is vividly on display in Ethereum, which is like the second largest and second most robust cryptocurrency, right? I've talked to senior Ethereum engineers over the last couple of weeks trying to figure out what is the monetary policy of Ethereum? No one can tell me. No one knows how much ETH is going to be minted in 2022 and 2023 after they shift to proof of stake. It, it, I've seen estimates that range from 100,000 to 2 million. So at the end of the day, you're going to be trusting a small group of people to make those decisions. That is what we are escaping with Bitcoin. So all these other cryptocurrencies, they might have their use cases. Virtually all of them are not. It's very important for people to know that if you take like the 4,500 cryptocurrencies on CoinMarketCap, almost all of them are scams, straight up. Mm -hmm. Even the ones that have like noble intentions, I just don't think are going to add that much value. Um, ultimately, I think Bitcoin to me is the innovation and, and, you know, that's because it has a monetary policy and an issuance schedule that cannot be changed. And that's what gets me so excited about it. I mean, that's why it's such an important tool for human rights. Well, I mean, look, I look the, the, the number letters. two <laughs> cryptocurrency in the world, probably by like how useful it is to people is Tether, which is totally centralized, has blacklists. So I'm not saying there won't be like new digital assets that are lumped into this category that have right. usage, but they're not, they're not, it's not the same innovation as Bitcoin. It's just sort of building on this idea of like a Euro dollar, maybe like a dollar that is minted outside of the control of the US Federal Reserve, right? It would be a Euro dollar. So stable coins are kind of like Euro dollars just minted by private actors in a way, right? But they're still tied to the dollar. They're pegged to the dollar. They're not escaping the system. Escaping the system is Bitcoin, we, we aren't reliant on the dollar. We, we have our own, you know, full um, store value, medium of exchange, unit of account yeah. eventually. And, you know, the Bitcoin world will be denominated in different terms. And I think everyone, everything else will be tied to it. I really do. Yeah, so it's been interesting. It's been 12 years, okay? More than 12 years since Satoshi Nakamoto created Bitcoin. And they haven't been able to stop it. They have tried. They have tried a lot. Uh, I wrote a long essay for Quillette on this. Like, like, why haven't governments been able to stop Bitcoin? And my thesis is essentially that there's been like this mix of different kind of technical, social, uh, ec and economic and political incentives and disincentives that make it very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and I think to me, the, 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 the best way to think about it is that Bitcoin's like a Trojan horse. So just, just to actually tell that story just a little bit, because I think it's important to, to understand the classical mythology tail. Um, I find this very interesting. Oh, of the actual, uh, Trojan, of the actual horse? Trojan horse. Yeah. yeah, which was told in, in the Aeneid, actually, mm -hmm. by, by Virgil, right? And the idea was the Greeks had been like trying to take the city of Troy for like a decade at these like impregnable walls and they couldn't do it. And Ulysses and the rest of the Greek army were like, we don't know what to do. Um, so Minerva, the, the, the god of strategy and war, you know, kind of like they get this idea from her, I guess, to, to actually try to use subterfuge and trickery to take over the city. So the idea is to, and this was sort of hatched by Ulysses, right, to put this horse together that would kind of be like a gift. So the idea was the Greeks just like pretended to leave 
right? They, they deserted. They left behind one soldier and this horse. And the Trojans looked at it and they were like, what's going on here? And the, they brought in the soldier and the soldier's like, look, they, they left. They're so sorry for all of the desecration and blood spill. Mm. This is their gift to you. It's, you know, honoring Minerva. You know, it's like this, like, you know, trophy for you guys. Yeah. And there were actually people inside Troy, uh, Cassandra, a prophet, as well as Laokuan, who was like a priest who said, no, 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 this is obviously a trick. This is obviously a trick. Um, but they were like dispatched and ignored because the horse was like, it was just like so badass. So the, the Trojans were like, bring it in the city. So they brought it in themselves. No blood spilled at all, right? Mm -hmm. In the middle of the night, of course, we, what you realize is the horse was packed with Greek soldiers and they come out and they let the army in, which was like hiding behind an island. So this idea that like something could be so attractive that you really can't say no, even if you know what's inside of it, is it played with, in Bitcoin? Mm -hmm. So like, in Bitcoin has this number go up technology, right? It is what we call it in, in sort of shorthand, NGO, NGU, right? But what people don't realize is that NGU is like the Trojan uh, horse. Yeah. Inside the Trojan horse is FGU, freedom go up technology. So dictators and rogue regimes and corporations uh, are gonna buy, mine, tax, accumulate this thing because it's the best performing financial asset in the world. What they don't realize or they're gonna to have to ignore is that they're also aiding and abetting this freedom technology, which allows individuals to be sovereign and eventually erodes their power. There's no question that rogue regimes and bad actors have already used and will continue to use Bitcoin. The thing is, when you think about a North Korea or a Venezuela, and that government instructs some of its bureaucrats and cronies and officials to start stealing Bitcoin or accumulating it or whatever, for short-term gain to get around sanctions and, and use it to buy dollars or something like that, right? Which they can't get normally. Well, guess what? All those people who the regime has instructed to like figure this thing out and use it, they're all gonna realize, oh my God, this is money the government doesn't control and it's gonna spread like a virus, okay? So this is like the idea of the Trojan horse allegory. Why I think it's so important and powerful with Bitcoin. All the people talking about Bitcoin today on TV, they don't care about freedom or privacy. They just care about number go up. But what they don't realize is what's concealed within. And that's very, very powerful to me. So the people talking about Bitcoin on TV are maybe investor yeah, types. professional investors, yeah. uh, cor corporations, and soon governments. I mean, you just but, had today, this morning on CNBC, the leader of, of uh, the Republican leader of the House of Representatives, a congressman saying like, we need to be pro Bitcoin as a country. And the other day, Peter Thiel had a very interesting comment where he was basically like, let's not fall behind China in this race. So you have influential people in our government, uh, like sort of posturing for this like, a, you know, Bitcoin race that's going to happen in the next 10 years. You're going to see this. Countries are going to compete to stack yeah. Bitcoin. So Absolutely. You Freedom go up. Freedom go up, which is it uh, ultimately gives power to the individuals to de so decentralize. Yeah, the I mean, like system. when Tesla stacks Bitcoin, they're just doing that as self interest. They think it's going to be a good inflation hedge. Fine, but what they maybe don't care about, don't realize, or they don't need to care. I mean, Bitcoin's power is it like co opts people into promoting a freedom tool, even if they don't care about or even if they hate freedom. It doesn't matter. So when Tesla stacks Bitcoin and the price goes up and more interest goes up and more people around the world are like, wow, Bitcoin, then more people get involved. Again, more adoption, more price, more developers, better user interface, more privacy tools, um, more mining, more network security. It's just this like positive feedback loop that continues to grow and it will, it will grow intensely in the next decade as we go through the adoption cycle. And the reason why I'm so excited about this is the human rights world, again, to get back to our previous conversation, it is very hard to find people who, who have you know, the empathy or the altruism to actually make a difference abroad in places like China or Saudi Arabia or North Korea. Um, people are very quick to just like, they'll just quickly toss off the pretty words that they care about human rights as soon as profits come into play. So there's no alignment of incentives, right? The reason why Bitcoin is so powerful is that it aligns the incentives. All of a sudden, they can be as greedy as they want. They are being forced to promote a freedom tool. This I've never seen before, and it makes me it gives me a lot of like excitement. It's very refreshing because we've been laboring in the human rights space and you have to like raise money and it's all like nonprofit work and you're like begging for people to make a difference for you. Here you have this like incredible asset which people will accumulate out of self-preservation, self-interest and greed, and yet it will strengthen the power of the individual. That is what we need to fight big brother. That's what we need to fight. Like what I'm scared is happening in China. Like this growing authoritarian state, which is powered by big data analysis, this is our way to fight back. And, and 
it runs on this like really interesting engine again that like takes advantage of our base nature as humans. Mm -hmm. And I know that it sounds terrible for me to say this, but I mean, ultimately we are self-interested and it is hard to, to get people to care about others living a thousand miles away. You know, we are kind of localized in our empathy. Speaking as someone who works to help people who live in like a hundred different countries, it's very difficult to get Americans to care about what's happening in Belarus or in Kashmir. It just is. But guess what? They're going to definitely care about Bitcoin because they want to see their, their net worth go up. They want to do better for their family, et cetera. They're going to get into this thing. And it's really going to like make that powerful tool for everyone else who's using it. So this interplay dynamic is fascinating to me. Yeah, I don't like it either, but it, 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 we, have, but we have to be realists here. You have to acknowledge it and then maybe use it for your advantage. And it's not just Bitcoin itself. Like exchanges today are adopting something called Lightning Network, mm -hmm. which is a way to scale Bitcoin on a second layer. Much like we had gold bars, which we scaled with paper money. And then we had Visa credit cards, which were a way of scaling the paper notes. Bitcoin scales through Lightning Network. It's a private, instant, globally final settlement network. It's, it's something you all should check out. It's very, very interesting. The exchanges aren't adopting Lightning for its privacy ben benefits. Like Lightning operates off the chain, meaning surveillance companies can't see, they can't do chain analysis on Lightning because it's, it's on an onion routed second layer kind of that works kind of like the Tor, mm -hmm. Tor project. The exchanges don't care about privacy. They're doing it because it reduces fees. Lightning is cheaper and faster. <laughs> so again, we have this but... really interesting alignment of incentives where like the freedom tech is being promoted by people who don't, I don't, it doesn't matter what their incentives are. I could care less if they were altruistic or not. And I think this is, and, and you're going to maybe see this even in the future. There's more things coming in Bitcoin down the pike. Uh, Lightning was enabled by an upgrade called SegWit, right? Which had, took place a few years ago, which was the culmination of the block size conflict. Mm -hmm. There's another thing coming up called cross input signature aggregation, which may, if it, if it takes effect in the next few years, it may compel exchanges to collaboratively spend all their Bitcoin together in a way that really protects our privacy and fights surveillance, but they're not going to do it for, for moral reasons. They're going to do it because it's going to save them money and improve their bottom line. Uh, can you speak to that kind of collaborative so that you, ha you can have multiple parties in a single transaction kind of thing? Yeah. Or? Like you could do that today. Absolutely. It's called the coin join, for example, but right now it's more expensive to coin join in Bitcoin. You have to pay a premium for your privacy. This would flip that on its head and would basically say, if you have one transaction, Hey, pile them all in, have as many parties as you want. The more parties you get in, the cheaper it's going to be per party. Okay. And, and that's not possible in Bitcoin today, but it might be in the future. But again, the beauty, the beauty in Bitcoin are these like, the, these ways that it just aligns human incentives and it aligns our like most base desires and, and needs and realities with like freedom and privacy. And mm -hmm. that I've never seen before. And, and that's why I think it's, it's so interesting. No, I, and I'll give you two reasons. Number one, the Bitcoin blockchain is ultimately a settlement layer. It's kind of like something like Fedwire in the United States. It's a way for like institutions to settle with each other. That's what I think it's going to be like in 20, 30 years from now. The average person is never going to touch the Bitcoin blockchain probably. Mm -hmm. They're going to use things like Lightning or un unfortunately they may use Bitcoin banks, but they'll either use custodians or, the, or they'll use second layer non-custodial solutions to interact. Mm -hmm. The main chain is going to get very expensive. It's going to be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars or, or even more if the dollar starts to weaken mm -hmm. uh, to make a transaction on the main chain. And that will be reserved for like very large transactions or transactions that need final, final settlement, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think that that's, that's fine and, and, and that's okay. And it's very important that that ledger, that settlement layer be kept by thousands of people around the world. The Bitcoin blockchain is not centralized. It is, it is decentralized. It is run by people like me who run a node at home. I run a personal server. I run the Bitcoin blockchain. No one else. You run it. That person runs it. There's no, there's no one in Well, you have a full charge. node? Yeah, I run a full node. <laughs> it's great. I mean, it's pretty easy, man. You run it and that way you can be sovereign over all of your usage, right? Beautiful. 
And you can run it on a Raspberry Pi with less than 150 bucks of equipment. <laughs> and that's so important because again, there is no Amazon web service vulnerability here. That is a problem. And I agree with you. We're, we're trending in a bad direction. We're like the government could just turn off, you know, a big important website or a news source. Well, they can't turn off Bitcoin because it doesn't live on AWS. It lives with us. We are Bitcoin. And I think that that's, that's very, very powerful. Um, <laughs> Everything's an engineering trade-off, but yeah, you can trade off some of the assurances of the base layer to go into Lightning, for example, and, and there you can get more speed and more privacy and the things that Bitcoin lacks, speed and privacy, for example, um, you can get on these second layers. So there's, there's all kinds of cool engineering things that people are coming up with. Um, but I also would just say, anyone who says the blockchain, like that's a red flag for that person doesn't really know what they're talking about. Like Satoshi didn't use the blockchain in the the, the the white paper. Blockchain was a marketing term come, that people came up with later to try and do this thing that was kind of like, it peaked in 2015 and it, and it continues to be an issue today of it's blockchain, not Bitcoin. And that was like a very corporate um, kind of social attack on Bitcoin Gosh. to say we could take this like ledger part of this radical thing that's for criminals and all these bad people, but we could take one part of it out and we could bring it over here and we could make it safe for everybody. The real McCoy's Bitcoin, I mean, Satoshi referred to it as the time chain. I mean, really what they're talking about is just these like blocks that are connected chronologically of transactions. It's really not that exciting. The exciting part of Bitcoin is, is the proof of work, you know, where the transaction processing is done by mining and by energy and by real world expenditures instead of like, you know, some central ledger. And, you know, when you remove the blockchain from Bitcoin, it's not very, to me, it's just not, it's, it's just not that interesting. It's not though, like it's outside of maybe Ethereum. Mm -hmm. Every other blockchain is easy to mess with. So I, I, you're saying that Every proof of work is what one. makes it hard to mess Absolutely. with. Absolutely, proof of work is the key. Right. And, and Ethereum is about to leave proof of work. So it's about to go to proof of stake, which is literally the existing system where a small group of people get to decide the monetary policy. Yeah, reputation has a lot of value there and that you could be, it could be manipulated. I may sound brutal, but I'm coming at it from a political science perspective. For me, it's all about freedom versus dictatorship. And that's why I find it so compelling that, that regardless of how much power or might or how many armies you have, you can't change the rules of Bitcoin. <laughs> Well, as we've talked about, my career started in human rights and in promoting individual freedom and fighting authoritarianism. That fight will, will continue on, no matter what happens with Bitcoin. Um, I think it would be a massive failure and a tragedy if this project like didn't work. The and Bitcoin project. Yes, if the Bitcoin project didn't work, it, we would, it would, honestly, it's one of the only thing, things that gives me hope because it is an effective way to push back against the creeping centralized control. Um, if for whatever reason, and I can't really see, one of the reasons I'm so into it is I can't really see how it's not gonna work. Again, I think the Trojan horse allegory is too powerful. Um, these big centralized actors are gonna be too greedy and they're gonna want some as opposed to banning it. It's way easier for them to buy it than to ban it. I think that's just what's gonna happen. But if, but if whatever, for whatever reason it failed, I would have very little hope left because really, I mean, the Chinese model of like centralizing all of your data and controlling it, I mean, ultimately is, is a very, very powerful um, sort of like arch force. And I, I, I would be concerned that that would be all of our, of our sort of destiny. Fooled, I mean, fooled, like, fooled, yeah. and people in the humanitarian sector have been fooled into thinking that some centralized blockchain project is going to help some refugee. All collapsed. <laughs> Goes wrong with Bitcoin, and I've seen it. Um, people fall for these, like, I mean, like in these different countries, I'm trying to like talk to to different people about Bitcoin, and like the, the amount of like MLM schemes, pyramid schemes, Ponzi schemes. It, there are just so many of them, and there's plenty here too. But like. In Zimbabwe, I was talking to this guy who is a reporter who studies the FX, like the foreign currency exchange markets. He's just saying one of the main reasons people don't want to get into Bitcoin is because they've been scammed so hard by all these other things. So I would say that that's one, one way it could go wrong is that like people just continue to be like um, afraid of it because of things that are like that in the past. <laughs> I took this personality test and I'm a, a 99 skepticism. So <laughs> I was first, sadly, because I was first introduced to Bitcoin in 2013. And I was like, eh, whatever. And it took me four years 
to actually get into it, to go down the rabbit hole. I didn't really start to grasp it and start getting excited about it until 2017. So I was regrettably very, very skeptical for a long time. And I just thought it was like, whatever. So I, I appreciate that. And, and you should be skeptical. Um, but ultimately, you got to believe in things like, I believe in democracy. I believe it's good for people. I believe it's better than tyranny. I believe in the internet. I, I know that we've had issues with centralization of the internet, but I still believe it's better to be connected than to have bridges between us. And I believe in Bitcoin. And, and I, to me, it's like a very similar progressive force that, that we're encountering. Um, but but I, I, yeah, be skeptical. Nothing, nothing, um, nothing will befall you that's bad if you're like cautious and skeptical. That's like a good, good, good mentality to have. I mean, look, you have patriotism and then you have jingoism, right? It's very important that we stay on the patriotic side. Like as an American, I'm very patriotic in terms of, I love the values that this country was founded on if you read the Bill of Rights. And I love the fact that it was just flexible enough that we were able to change it to, to grant, or at least to try to grant all people the same rights. It yes. was not the original plan of the founders, right? It had to be changed. But since, you know, then we've, we've remained... Um, you know, like, you know, th those laws have, have remained and they're very good. Uh, and I'm very proud of that. What I'm not proud of is the jingoistic part of our country where we invade other countries and bomb other countries. I'm not proud of our prison system. I think it's a huge stain on our nation. I'm not proud of a lot of things. So I think you can be patriotic, but you can be, you know, critical of your country. Um, and that's important. You know, I, I feel like the jingoistic thing is, is the thing that we need to watch out for. Um, that's just my own personal take. Yeah, I just read, the, again, this New Yorker piece that just came out that you should read. It's called Ghost Walls. And it's the story of how the Chinese Communist Party is committing genocide right now, just like other regimes did and the Turks did to the Armenians and the Nazis did to the Jews. I mean, it's happening again right now. We said never again. And, you know, that's just not true. We're letting it happen. And again, with the business stuff, like people are, like Airbnb is like a sponsor of the Olympics. Like what? Great Blueprint is the, the fight against the South African apartheid. So I, I, we did a few events down in Johannesburg um, and I, I've had the pleasure of being able to go to the apartheid museum several times. Um, and it really does a good job of chronicling how they were able to do it. It took a while, there's no doubt, but the way it was done was good. Um, peaceful, action from abroad was very important. So there was like the Sullivan principles. So like um, you can peacefully protest as a company, uh, particular regimes, um, and it, it's very effective and not just corporations, but like the Olympics is a great example. Like the Chinese government should not be able to host the Olympics. The IOC should say no, not until you close down those prison camps. This is a perfect peaceful way to push back. No one gets hurt. Same thing when we had the Korean Olympics a few years ago. North Korea should not have been allowed any sort of symbolistic kind of hosting rights there. They have prison camps, gulags that we can see from outer space very clearly. And their regime is the cruelest one on the planet, probably. Why were they able to sit and cheer and, and you know, get to sort of co-host those at the Olympics? This is spineless. Like the, the IOC, the Olympics and major corporations should stand up. Um, especially in the cultural sector where you don't lose anything, like, you know, or you shouldn't have to lose anything. So I think if we look at the way that uh, we forced the apartheid regime um, out, uh, this international solidarity of musicians, athletes, performers, celebrities is very, very powerful. Unfortunately, today's celebrities are doing the opposite. We just, you know, had this press release go out yesterday about Akon, and he's he's off whitewashing the crimes of the dictator of Uganda and trying to build a future city there with him. You know, if this was the 1980s, Akon would be raising his fist and saying, we need to, you know, fight the apartheid regime. How do we get back to that? You know, we need to think about that. We have to figure out how to harness celebrities, influencers, and companies and get them to actually stand up for something for once. I mean, that's something we've lost. We have really had a spine against that. Um, and, and, you know, we, we've lost it, you know, and, and you lose things, they, you lose them forever. Look at Tibet. Tibet was a big cause for people in the 90s. Used to go to colleges and kids would have the Tibetan flags all over the dorm rooms. It was like ra Radiohead would have Tibet on the stage and mm. everybody wanted to, you know, free Tibet was a big thing. Well, guess what? Like we lost it for some reason. It's not a thing anymore and Tibet has been totally colonized, you know? So I, I think it's important that we find a way to unlock um, an interest 
of in the celebrity classes among athletes, singers, presidents. You know, we need to find a way to punish these people. Productive activism. I'm very jaded. I mean, it's very difficult to to do these things at scale effectively. I do not believe we will be successful in boycotting the Chinese Olympics. We weren't in 2008. I don't think and they're much more evil now, and I don't think we're going to be able to do it this time. And that, again, to go back to the, the Bitcoin piece, that's why I'm like very interested in this thing, because it doesn't require my altruism. It doesn't require some famous singer or some gotcha. corporation to, to sacrifice anything. Yeah. They're literally just going to follow their own profit-seeking, self-interested motives, and they're going to end up making a stronger human rights tool for other people. Uh, I hope not. I hope not. In the cyberspace I, and I, potentially even a hot war. I think there's too many people with too much money to be lost to go to a hot war on both sides. But eventually we're just going to, someone's going to have to stand up. I mean, the subjugation of Hong Kong and the genocide of the Uyghurs and the colonization of Tibet. I mean, Taiwan is the next big thing. I mean, Xi Jinping has made it very clear, you know, Xinjiang, Tibet, Hong Kong, Taiwan. So we're going to have to stand up for Taiwan for, for different reasons, both for moral reasons, but also for semiconductor reasons. We need TSMC to be on our side. Right. We cannot have China take over TSMC. So um, there's different reasons why we're going to have to protect Taiwan. Um, and you just hope it's not a hot war. I mean, at this point. No empire lasts forever. And it's impossible to predict when these regimes fall. I mean, no one, no one thought the Soviet Union was going to fall when it fell. Like, that, like if you study like the news yeah. and the scholarship of the era, no one knew that the Tunisian government was going to fall after Mohamed Bouazizi lit himself on fire. No one, no one, re no one predicted that that would become what we we now know as the Arab Spring. Right? These things are impossible to predict. And one day the Chinese regime will fall. I just it, we don't know when. Um, yes. Yeah, the party. <laughs> you want to leave the party before it starts to deteriorate. Um, I, I think America could continue to have like a major, major leadership role for a long, long time. Um, I think certain things we do will become maybe no longer possible in terms of the way we intimidate people on the world stage and the term, especially the way we use our currency as a weapon. I think that that's going to decline over time as we become more of a multipolar world. Um, but I, I do still believe in America and the values that we're founded on, despite all the warts. I do believe in us and I would prefer us absolutely to be the most prominent of the multipolar world vis-a-vis -vis a regime like Russia or China. Absolutely. There's no question. I'm very concerned about social media platforms and companies. It almost feels like we're losing the golden age of the internet. You know, when we could like go online and, and, inter and, you know, interact with each other and share and not be worried about censorship. It feels like that, that was a golden age, like in the late nineties, the two thousands, and now everything is, is becoming very politicized. And I'm not sure that there's a solution. Like, I don't think there's a button we can press to fix it. I'm kind of uh, afraid that this is sort of just what happens when uh, societies digitize. Like, like I, th I think that certain opinions just become demonized in, in, in the sort of, um, <clears throat> in, in the room, in the, in the social room that we have on the internet. Uh, and I don't know if there's a magical solution there. I do know that there's technological solutions that will allow us to continue to communicate and for creators to reach their audiences without censorship. Mm -hmm. um, and that's very exciting. Like right now you could be deplatformed uh, from your, uh, you know, from like whether it's uh, Patreon or YouTube or whatever, um, and your, your bank account can be closed down, right? There are emerging ways that Adam Curry, like the pod father and a bunch of other people are experimenting with, where you can essentially have your audio podcast across a whole bunch of different, um, you know, platforms. So, you know, it's censorship resistant. And then your audience can pay you over lightning in streaming money. Like they can stream you money as they listen. Mm -hmm. So you're removing the whole advertising piece. You don't need to do advertising anymore. You have this direct relationship with, um, your, uh, you, you know, your audience. And this is possible with something like lightning where you can do streaming money that's censorship resistant. And a lot of the people who are building the lightning network, for example, Elizabeth Stark, who, you know, started lightning labs and you know, has done 
in her within her company, the people that work work with her have built a huge part of the lightning infrastructure. You know, what animates her is this idea of like uh, again, artists and creators being able to have that direct um, ability to reach out and have that peer to peer relationship with their with their audience. And I, I'm excited for that, and I, I do think that's coming. But but I I am very worried that the golden age of like like let it centralized social media platforms is kind of behind us. Um, and I'm not sure how to fix that. I don't know if that's like a fixable problem. Twitter that bad right now? Like, I mean, it's fixable in as much as you can do a verification. So you, you can give a blue check to someone and then that person is like more credible and they go to the top of the comments and there's like tweaks you can do. You, mm-hmm. you can continue to improve it, but it's not going to fix the fact that like Twitter can decide to, kick off the president. And like a lot of people are going to be upset by that, you know, like there's ways you can improve the UX over time and they continue to do so. Like Clubhouse is a, is a lot of fun, great phenomenon. So is Twitter spaces. So they continue to iterate, but the, the censorship deplatforming piece, I'm not sure is fixable because if you, I mean, you watch the U S government haul these people, haul, haul, um, Zuckerberg and, and Dorsey and whatever in front of Congress, they want more censorship. I mean, our elected leaders want more censorship, right? Let's keep it simple. Um, Let's look at one example, uh, Twitter and Jack Dorsey. And I I think it's quite clear that what he believes is the solution is, as you're kind of hinting at, a more kind of like um, regionalized uh, system, which is not have one, or we call federated system, right? Which does not just have like one company in charge of everything, but there's an open protocol. And then there's like different instances, right? So Twitter make, you know, Jack's dream for Twitter is that Twitter is this open protocol that the Russian government can use and the Chinese government can use and the Iranian government can use and the American government can use. And then Twitter as a company is going to use too. And you as the customer decide which implementation you want to join. And there's going to be different censorship on each instance or each federation, but uh, the protocol itself would be like untouchable. This is kind of like the idea behind the internet, right? There's like different parts of the internet that are censored, but like at the very bottom of the very bottom of the backbone of it, it's like this this globally connected, um, relatively unstoppable thing, right? So I think that's a pretty good vision. And Twitter's working towards that with the blue, blue sky like yeah. initiative. We'll see. I'm a little skeptical that it like works out because I've used, I use Mastodon, for example. Mm-hmm. Mastodon is an example of a um, federated social media. Now it's, it's ruled by a benevolent, each instance is ruled by a benevolent dictator. <laughs> it's just like, I happen to like this one. Yeah. So I know. So rather than trust one dictator, Twitter, you could you could you could choose which dictator you want to trust, and that's yeah. kind of the federated model. And maybe we head that way, but you lose things when it's federated. You lose the UX, you lose the slickness and the, and the feel, and all the millions of dollars that they spend on developers. Like Mastodon is like not anywhere close to as nice to use as Twitter. So I, I feel like it's again it's this trade off that we make with everything, where it's convenience, comfort, speed versus privacy and freedom. Right? It, it, it's very hard to have something yeah. that gives you both. I guess maybe you're more optimistic about people caring. I I feel like not so few people actually care about their, their privacy and freedom. I've just watched everybody give it up, you know? Um, But, but, but we'll see, I guess just to, to bookend that, I, I think we're at this moment where obviously the centralized platforms are just so much easier and better to use and to, to strike it out and, 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 you know, adventure out and use a, uh, like a federated instance or something, yeah. even like Keybase, which is kind of like a cool encrypted way to like have group chats. Um, it just requires like a lot of your time and a lot of people don't have that time. But I will say one thing, like I do think there's this future where um, we do go into more of this like, uh, tri- it's called a, a tribal model or like tribes, um, which is this social environment being built on top of Lightning um, by uh, an app called Sphinx. And the idea is like, kind of like, it's like a decentralized Slack. Like you have your Slack instance, which has like a bunch of people in the community and you have different ways to um, message each other and it's all encrypted. And then it has like plugins for like things like Jitsi instead of Zoom. So like an open source encrypted video messenger. It has ways to like plug in the content you want to get from like, uh, like different, um, 
platforms that you follow, like podcasts, things like that. And again, it allows you to pay those people directly in a censorship resistant private way. So it's really nice to connect to the Lightning Network. Yeah. So it's all sort of built on Lightning, but the idea you can think about it is like, you're slowly starting to build up the idea of a WeChat, but with freedom principles. Right. Because right now WeChat's like the king of convenience and comfort, but of course it's feeding all that data to the big brother and the surveillance state. Um, and then we have like our own versions over here in America that are not quite as convenient <laughs> or amazing, but like we, we give up slightly less pr- you know, privacy and freedom. But this thing has a lot of pr- promising features to it. It's worth checking out. It's very like early days. Like it feels like, I mean, I was pretty young, but it, it feels like, the 90s in the internet. Like it has that feeling. The, where Sphinx you, does. You, you, yeah, you know it's rough around the edges, but you can feel the magic. It's, it's pretty cool. It's like kind of a pain to use, right? For, yeah. You want privacy. Yeah, so Signal signals are an upgrade. way better. Yep. I mean, and it's way better than it was five years ago. And it's, it's not quite as good as like, not quite as seamless, right? As like a WhatsApp yet, um, but it's almost there. And they were able to do it, yeah. and and, I, and you're going to see that with with Bitcoin wallets as well. I mean, they're they're almost there. They're like if you use like like a Moon wallet is like, pff, I mean, it's so cool looking and it's so seamless. And they've spent so many hours thinking about your experience. We are getting there. Whereas ten years ago, it was like impossible to use. You're on it, man. To That's, switch. I mean, the the reason. No, but I haven't switched everything to it. You know what I mean? Like the, a. Yeah, the exodus to Signal was in in January. They had a huge user uh, surge for two main reasons. One, hilariously enough, of course, was Elon tweeted like, "You should use Signal," right? Um, <laughs> which is not insignificant. And then the other one was uh, that like WhatsApp changed kind of some of its terms of service and like you know announced to all of its users in this little pop up. Um, that it was going to be sort of like changing the way it handled your data, that spooked a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So these two things really combined um, and tens of millions of people in the following weeks between January and February joined Signal. It's like, it really has had its day in the sun. Um, And they are like frantically trying to keep up with it. Like, and it's really nice to see that, uh, that, that this encrypted messaging service, which, which prioritizes your privacy um, in a way that, you know, you know, the government, again, may know like the metadata, but doesn't know exactly what you're saying unless they can get your hands on your phone. I think that's very, very powerful. So it can be done. I, I don't want to be uh, too jaded here. I think it can be done. Yeah, I think so. Um, I, I think we can fight back and I think we can make, continue to make these digital communications tools and platforms um, in a way that, that, that really benefits us. Yeah, so our chairman at, at the Human Rights Foundation was Václav Havel. Uh, who, of course, was like the famous Czech democracy activist uh, who, you know, helped lead the Velvet Revolution and then ended up becoming uh, the first democratically elected uh, leader uh, of the Czech Republic after the Soviet Union fell. Um, He passed away in 2011 and it was very difficult to find a replacement uh, because who can fill Havel's shoes, you know? But if one could, it would be Gary, right? So we like really tried to get Gary to join and thankfully he agreed. And uh, we've had an amazing relationship with Gary over the years. I mean, he's been relentless in his pursuit of freedom. I mean, he could have retired and taken his career in a different direction and he could be hanging out with Putin and have a pleasure yacht and all kinds of stuff, but he decided to risk it. (laughs) And if you actually study like the times when he was running for uh, president in Russia, Masha Gessen followed him around in The Man Without a Face. It's a great, great book about Putin. Um, there's a fabulous chapter where she's following around Gary when he's campaigning. And I mean, that he risked a lot. I mean, he can't go back to Russia anymore. He gave up his country. Um, he's given up a huge amount to be able to speak his mind and to have this dream, this beautiful vision of a free and democratic Russia. He really believes in it. It's been a great experience. I work very closely with Gary. Uh, we talk a lot. Um, we do different things uh, around the world together. He's he's come out to a lot of events in different cities around the world. Um, and he's been a very active chairman. This isn't some figurehead. He's very involved and it's really, really great. I mean, everything he's involved with is, uh, it's, you know, as one journalist who attends our events says, uh, when he walks in the room, you know, the average IQ of the room goes up you know, <laughs> pretty significantly. Uh, I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a big chess person, unfortunately. So I have not been able to connect with him on that, but yeah. I think he probably would prefer it that way. You know, <laughs> all he gets is people who want to talk to him about chess, you know? Yeah. So here we can, we can talk about kind of human rights strategy and like, uh, 
how to, you know, improve our fight against, uh, against dictators. But, um, he, he really, you know, has that moral clarity that I, that I, that I really, uh, appreciate. So. Gary and a handful of other Russian activists that we work closely with, uh, including Vladimir Karamurza, who, again, I mean, it's just incredibly heroic. The man has survived two poisonings by Putin. Um, they like to say that, you know, Russians will bring democracy to Russia on their own terms. They don't need our help. This is what Vladimir especially says. But what he does say is that we should stop propping up Putin. Like that that's kind of his, uh, stop uh, kind of legitimizing him. That That's kind of his argument. He's like, we don't need your foreign interference. We don't need your ideas. We don't, you know, we don't need your help. We can do it on our own, but please stop like propping up our, you know, illegitimate ruler. That's kind of like his point of view, which, which I think is interesting um, and, and fair. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that's, so that's journalism though. I mean, that's very different from, you know, advocacy or strategic thinking about what to do with Russia. Um, absolutely, yes. yeah. yeah, we should interview everybody and everybody should know exactly what they're thinking. Yeah. I have a conflicted relationship with journalism because to me, press freedom is so core. Right. And independent yeah. journalists around the world are so brave, yes. um, and especially in countries like Russia or China, et cetera. And um, really good journalism is still something I absolutely, I love and I enjoy like yeah. this, especially like, to say again, this New Yorker piece on what's happening to the Uyghurs is incredibly well reported. However, on the same, by the you know, on the other hand, you have um, you know this sort of clickbaity journalism that's all about sensationalism, and and that gets used as a tool. I mean, you know, whether it be against things like privacy or Bitcoin or whatever, you have like people who sensationalize, and it gets used in the service of the surveillance state, the war on terror, whatever. You know, it's a it's a difficult, but uh, you know, I think journalism is essential to a free society. Um, but it can it can sometimes be it can wear my patience thin sometimes. <laughs> and not ask about the prison camps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so from the human rights perspective, one of our programs is we like we try to go after people who do like PR for dictators. So like, <laughs> one, like, and a lot of people do like PR firms in Washington get hired by all these dictators. Um, and oh, they make a lot of money to make them look good. It's called whitewashing or putting lipstick on a pig or whatever you want to do. Astroturfing is like the fake, you make like fake social media accounts to make it seem like you're popular. Um, but whitewashing is a huge issue. So, um, I think it's completely fair to interview like dictators and stuff like that. Amanpour does a pretty good job. She's she's really good. She 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 makes sure that there's no messing around. I mean, her interviews of Museveni recently, the mm. Ugandan dictator, was very good. I mean, she's basically like, well, <laughs> like, well, why are you rigging another election? Please tell us, you know. Yeah. And she's fearless and she's good, and that can be a helpful thing to have on YouTube as a resource. Um, but it's 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 quite clear when when it descends into a PR session and you just have to be like very careful about it. Like Asma al-Assad, the wife of the butcher in Syria, you know, was like profiled by, by Vogue. And it was this whole rose in the desert thing. It's a bunch of nonsense, terrible, 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 uh, total propaganda, but a like honest interview where you at, you know, you're asking about all the tough questions. Um, very important, you know. So is, I think I think you just, it's just a matter of like content. Right? Is is there a good resource to study whitewashing, like I mean, to know what manipulative PR looks you, like? I think you just you should know if, if if you've researched the topic, you should know it inside you because it would be. Are is there anything you're afraid to ask? <laughs> that would be oh, it. make sure just, you're asking all the questions. As yeah. long as you're asking all the questions that you have, you're good. But if there's something you're afraid to ask, then then maybe you, you're self censoring, right? Four books I'll briefly mention. Um, number one is The Fear. The Fear had a deep impact on me. The Fear was written by Peter Godwin. It's about the systematic dismantling of Zimbabwe under Robert Mugabe. Peter is Zimbabwean, and it is a riveting book. I think everyone should read it because it helps you understand what it's like to go through not just authoritarianism, but also hyperinflation. And I mean, really, you know, at the end of the day, what The Fear describes is how Mugabe took this country 
in the 1980s, and he actually brought it back in time to the 1920s in terms of infrastructure, uh, literacy rates, health rates, all these things. He stole so much from the people. And it's, it's a heartbreaking book, but it's a very important book. Um, and it's a, it's a way to do excellent, excellent journalism. So the fear is a good one. Isn't this a personal story? Absolutely. Yeah. Because he, he was, it's part of his whole family story and he's in there, he's interviewing people personally. Um, so I, I would say that one. A little bit, a little bit. I would say it's not deep. I have another book on, on that, which I'll recommend in a second, but I would just say that it's, it's a very powerfully written book about how society can, uh, basically deteriorate and how you can lose everything. Um, the second book is, I just mentioned it, but The Man Without a Face by Masha Gessen. Incredible book about modern Russia and Putin. Just a masterpiece. So that Could one be one is, of your favorite books about Putin and Russia? That one's the best. I mean, she's just so fearless. Incredible. She interviews Putin in the, in the book <laughs> at the end. It's, it's really good. Um, third one is a fiction book uh, called The Mandibles, uh, written by Lionel Shriver. This one's good. It's a good gift book. It's funny. It's dark. It's witty. But it's about the United States losing its status as the reserve currency and going into hyperinflation. Mm. And what's interesting is that the characters in the book map where we are today. The book itself is about the late, I think it's the late 2020s. And we have a populist president who decides to announce that the United States is like basically going to default on its debts. And the rest of the world comes up with like a new currency and everybody switches to that one. And the dollar like overnight becomes worthless. And all these like economists are saying, no, it's fine. Like inflation won't be a problem. And there's this one character who's an economist, who's like an economist. And he, He's basically, he gets to the point where he's living as a refugee in Prospect Park in Brooklyn, and he's still saying everything's fine, you know? So it's like, it's dry, it's witty, but it's also about um, the surveillance state. It's about centralization of power. It's really good. So The Mandibles, I would highly recommend. Um, so those three books, and then on the topic of Bitcoin, because we talked about it a lot, I would just say that my portal into Bitcoin was The Internet of Money by Andreas Antonopoulos. Oh, wow. Okay. And I did it by audiobook. And I just think this is an important one for people to start with because he goes through all the main concepts, whether it be proof of work or, you know, how the network functions, but he does it in a way that's extremely engaging and really fascinating. And it really just kind of like sparked my curiosity. Very different from the Bitcoin standard. It's, it's more for like the average person. Um, it's not a history book. It's a collection of his talks that he gave over like two or three years. It's not very technical. It's very approachable. Yeah. Um, and some of it might be dated now because it's like 2015, 2016. But I mean. Andreas is the goat. He's the goat. <laughs> Andreas is the goat. Andreas is the goat. I know a lot of people have issues with some of his like more recent work, but Andreas is the goat. I mean, yeah. he's the reason I'm in Bitcoin. I mean, he's the reason I'm in Bitcoin. So. So two years ago, I came together with seven other people from around the world. And we, we wrote a book in a book sprint. We lived in a house for four days. We wrote a book together. It was really cool. It was like a design sprint, but we did it in book format. And my co-authors are from Nigeria, Venezuela, the Philippines, from, from former Soviet Union, from all over. And it's called The Little Bitcoin Book. And I'm still proud of it. It's 100 pages. It's something you give to somebody who knows nothing about the topic. And it's not a technical book. It's about the sort of social political uh, aspect of it. Like, why is it important for you, for your finances, for your freedom, for, for your future? And uh, we've translated it into like a, a lot of languages by now. Uh, I think English, Spanish, and Portuguese are for sale. And at littlebitcoinbook.com, you know, you go buy it. But we, we've made it as, for, as a free PDF in Mandarin, Hindi, Punjab, uh, Korean, uh, Uyghur, which I was really excited about, <laughs> uh, Arabic, Farsi. Yeah. And I mean, it spreads, man. It's been really, really cool. So I'm proud of that. Um, I also made a video that, that did very well for Reason Magazine called Why is Bitcoin Protecting Human Rights Around the World? Mm -hmm. It's five minutes and it just, I feel like I tried to boil everything that I, that I want to tell you into this five minute video. So there's that, um, would recommend that. And then if, if you're interested in the 
why have governments not stopped it, which I think is really intriguing. I wrote this long essay in Quillette in February called, you know, um, why haven't governments banned Bitcoin? And um, maybe that'll be a helpful guide to some folks. Is it speaking to the Trojan horse idea that there's something uh, enticing about it? Yeah, at the end, it does get into that, but it really also just kind of goes through technically, why is it hard to do a 51% uh, attack? Like, gotcha. why, like if a government wanted to, could it really get all that equipment? There's a semiconductor shortage, like it can't. Like there, there's like certain things that stop governments from doing it, right? And same thing with like this idea of a 6102, which would be um, uh, based on the idea of the executive order 6102, which is from 1933 when FDR made holding gold illegal in the United States. Mm -hmm. The idea is that like banks would go around now with governments and try to like steal everybody's Bitcoin. Well, in Bitcoin, we have like a practice um, called proof of keys day every January 3rd, you know, which is coinciding with the launch of the Bitcoin blockchain, where we all like withdraw our keys from exchanges and we'd be sovereign users. What we are uh, doing is we are preparing for a 6102 attack, which will yeah. one day probably come, right? So the essay just goes through all of the like possible attacks and it runs through like the ones that happened, like the Chinese and Indian governments, the two largest governments in the world, both tried to attack Bitcoin mm -hmm. by banning their citizens from exchanging fiat for Bitcoin. It didn't work. Interest instead exploded. It's like the Barbara Streisand effect mm -hmm. where in, when, you know, by by making something public and saying you shouldn't do X, it actually increases attention about X a lot more, right? Um, so I, I think there's a lot of interesting game theory there that people would enjoy. First of all, Bitcoin has been attacked, again, many times. And we talk about the, you spoke about this with Nick Carter on your show, um, the sort of protocol wars or conflict or whatever, yeah. right? And Bitcoin almost died a whole bunch of times during that and ended up surviving. Oh, wow. I didn't I didn't know how bad the block was. Oh, it so got the block really was, was bad. It was, a, it, was a, it was sort of a very existential threat and um, Bitcoin survived. And that's why I'm so intrigued by it is that it, it basically survived an attack in an environment several years ago when Bitcoin was much more vulnerable than it is today. Um, it, it survived an attack by a conglomeration of Chinese billionaires, Silicon Valley corporations, and a ton of people who owned the majority of the hash rate and all of this infrastructure. They had 83% of all the hash rate and they couldn't get what they wanted. And that was so intriguing to me. Like, why didn't it, why didn't it get killed? So as Nick said, I think you should read the Block Size War, which is a book on, that you can get on Amazon by Jonathan Beer, really good, kind of like really important to understand the, 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 the scaling conflict and the visions over the different visions of what Bitcoin should be. And, you know, again, people like me believe it should be a freedom tool, not like a payments technology for retail. And I'm just, I'm glad it worked out the way it did because it, it almost didn't. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess long-term we'd want to decentralize, right? We don't want a single point of failure. <laughs> in the, in uh, the physical the, space. The, the earth is a single point of failure. Um, but no, I mean, you look at all this kind of like space uh, fiction and I mean, who would want to live on Mars, man? It's like a freaking desert. I mean, the earth is so beautiful. I hope we can save it. You know, it's just so gorgeous. When you look at the earth compared to any other like exoplanet or whatever, you look at it. I mean, the earth is so spectacular and wondrous and singular. I think we've got to do everything we can to save it here. Yeah, no, I was born the day before the Challenger blew up. And uh, it was always so tragic for me to look back on that because that really like altered our arc in terms of yeah. space exploration. Like if that had not happened, we'd be on a very different arc. And I do respect and admire people pushing for exploration. But I, I at the same time, I just... I want to recognize like the, we just, you know, we know how unique earth is. And I, I do think we got to do everything we can to, uh, to protect it. But I think you avoid answering the question if we're going to destroy ourselves. I, oh, I guess. I guess I yeah. I, yeah. I guess. Are you if hopeful? We do not, you're, okay, fine. If we do not decentralize <laughs> properly out into different physical spaces, probably, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, look, I'm a lot more concerned about what's happening right now. Like, like what is destroying ourselves? If you were to go and see what's happening in Xinjiang or North Korea right now or Eritrea, that is destroying ourselves. Yeah. And it's already happened. So I guess the end, that's why I said that is yes. I mean, it, if you don't decentralize and power is completely under one 
person, um, life is destroyed uh, as we know it. And, and you know, you don't have to go into science fiction to, to know what a totalitarian hellscape dystopia is. There's several that exist already. And, and you know, let's try to like help those people <laughs> at the same time as we're trying to like push out into space would be my like counter, I guess. Just thinking about my own upbringing. I went to a public school here and um, we never learned about money. It was never part of our curriculum. Um, even personal finances was not part of our cur curriculum. You could take like an optional course to learn about like business or something. Um, and I think that that would be really valuable uh, as a young person or as a teenager um, to, to start incorporating into your children's lives is like a curiosity about what is money, I think would be very health healthy, regardless of what path that takes them down. Um, because we don't think about it enough, either from an administrative sort of personal finance thing about like responsibility, uh, or more fundamentally, like, what is it and who creates it? Where did it come from? Both of those things are very important. So my advice to a young person would be to get to the point where you feel like you can answer the question, what is money? <laughs> <laughs> So you ultimately see money as a, as kind of power and freedom and um, a mechanism it of is sovereignty. so core to everything. The United States, whether you want to call it the Pax Americana, the empire, the hyperpower, whatever you want to call this moment in time where the U.S. is dominant around the world, it is because of the fact that we have this petrodollar system where we are able to force uh, the Saudis and other oil producing nations to sell their oil in dollars. That is really inescapable, inseparable from our power. Um, and that's very rarely talked about. And it's, it's very important to understand. So yeah, if young people could start thinking about that stuff, it'd be good. You need to be 18 to have a bank account or whatever. Right. One, yeah. of, one of the people that we supported at HRF through our, we do software development funding mm -hmm. for people in Bitcoin, uh, open source projects. And he's one of the guys we funded is this uh, very young, smart sort of prodigy. He's like 17. But one of the reasons he got into Bitcoin was because he wanted to have control of his money when he was like 14. Yeah. I mean, if you think in history, people who invented uh, uh, all kinds of incredible contributions to science or math, I mean, a lot of them did it before they were 15. Yeah. Um, so think about that maturity that is capable and possible in many people. Like I've participated in some of the years ago, some of the sort of selection processes for like the Teal Fellowship, which is like really amazing. Like these people who are 14, 15, 16, who don't need to go to college. They're already like so smart, they can figure it out, but they wouldn't be allowed to have a bank account, right? So, hey, that's kind of cool. Like now you have a permissionless money, you can, you can open up yourself without uh, permission from your parents. That's kind of cool. Not just weirdos like you, yeah, I was gonna mention, one of the people I got who taught me about Bitcoin, her name is Roya Mapub. She's an Afghan uh, technology CEO. And in 2013, she started paying her employees in Bitcoin because uh, they were not allowed to open bank accounts, the women that worked for her. She started the, the country's first female, like all female software company. And if they brought cash home, their like husbands or uncles or brothers would steal it from them. There's like yes. a power patriarchal dominance thing going on. But they had phones and she was able to pay them in Bitcoin and no, no one knew and it gave them that power. And that, that's always stuck in my mind as a very interesting uh, effect of this kind of thing of permissionless money, like that it can be an empowerment tool. So absolutely. I was gonna be an engineer actually. And then in 2003, we invaded Iraq and I got very interested in why we did that as a nation. And I switched to uh, my focus of study to like international relations. And that's how I kind of went down the kind of political science democracy rabbit hole and ended up getting a job at the Human Rights Foundation. So that, that I'm a very much a child of like 9-11 and the Iraq war. Those are the two really formative events for me personally. <music> I think, first of all, 9-11 just shifted the world dynamics completely from a focus on big power politics between the U.S., Russia, and China to this new threat of Islamic terror. Um, and a lot of it, we learned later, a lot of the things we did were manufactured, choreographed, like there were no WMDs in Iraq. Like the reason our rulers said we needed to invade and destroy this country was a lie. Um, and that, that I think has really been forgotten. Like I think a lot of like the Zoomers like today, don't really know a lot about that time period. I mean, it was pretty crazy. Unanimously, I mean, Democrat, Republican, like 
Joe Biden, Hillary Clinton, like, and the Republicans, everybody wanted to invade this country. And it was very, it's very, um, it's a confusing time. There's a really good book by Ian McEwen called Saturday, a fiction book that takes place during, I think, 2003. And it's one day in the life of the doctor in London. It's really good though to revisit this time because he has two characters, he has a characters in the book, one of whom is very pro-war and one of them is very against war. Basically he, the father himself is pro-war and his son is against it. And they have all these debates. And it's nice to go back to revisit, but that time was, it's really crazy. And it, it really showed you that like the media could be captured into like helping promote this idea of like invading another country. So I was very curious about why we did it and like who, who was pulling the strings and why, what are the reasons that we went? And what's really interesting is that like, I took all these courses on it, interviewed all these decision makers, whether they were like neocons or whatever, different people who were involved. And the whole like dollar reserve currency thing, like really never came up until like, I, I learned about it more recently because mm -hmm. of Bitcoin. Like, and today when I look back, it seems kind of obvious that the reason we invaded Iraq was because Saddam Hussein wanted to sell oil in euros. Uh, this seems really obvious when you go back and look at the, the chronology of it. Um, and we were like, no, we actually don't want you to sell dollars in euros because that would threaten the dollar. So we're going to invade you and then you're not going to do it. And then no one else is going to like sell dollars in euro, you know, oil in euros, right? Um, I guess you could say the same thing about Gaddafi. But um, we, we as a nation have very much protected our reserve currency. Let's put it that way. Can't we be patriotic and be pro-America, but like not want the petrodollar? Like yeah. I should be proud of my country. Why do we need to be propping up the Saudis? Why do we need to be, you know, threatening to invade other countries if they sell their oil for a different currency? I think we can be just as powerful as we are today, if not more powerful in a Bitcoin world. If you think about the infrastructure Americans are building, all the innovations we're building, all the wealth we have, I think we'll be fine better than fine. And, and we won't have these horrible negative externalities. It's, it's really a, 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 an optimistic vision for the future. Leader, our leaders certainly haven't. We're, we're, what do we have like seven active wars right now. And, and neither the Russians and the Chinese, everybody's starting to invade everybody else. Yeah. So the big question is how do we prevent the rise of this like authoritarian um, surveillance state in China, while at the same time kind of diffusing the military industrial complex on our side. That to me is like the biggest challenge of our time. I don't have the answer, but we should keep digging. Don't often zoom out that much. I feel like my day job is pretty interesting. <laughs> it keeps me very engaged um, with all the stuff we've been talking about. Uh, as far as the meaning of life, though, it, it seems quite clear that we do have the possibility as, as a species to create um, these, you know, beautiful communities and constructs and to share an exploration of the world together um, that is often marred by cold realities that we've discussed. But I, I do feel like in a way... Um, that the meaning of life is that that pursuit, uh, um, of course, biologically is to you know to spread our species, right? But also to to pursue knowledge and science and innovation and 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 freedom. Most importantly, I mean, I think it, freedom has to guide us, or else we end up with prison camps. If, if we don't let freedom guide us, we end up with the prison camps. So we need to have scientific innovation and adventurism and colonization of the stars, but without the slavery and without the prison camps. I think that's so key. Arbitrary power, torture, uh, executions. We know these things are wrong. I mean, we know they're wrong. We don't have to read a book to know that. Um, but you do, you do need to people can get brainwashed. I mean, you talk to people who've grown up in North Korea that they, they don't know any better. <laughs> like they don't know what's going on in the outside world. So they've never experienced anything differently. So that's why, look, technology can play a big role here in terms of like the meaning of it all. Like it can really help emancipate, liberate people, at least so that they can make their own choices about what to do, at least so that we're on a level playing field. So technologies like the internet and Bitcoin, um, they can at least like give you the option to do things your own way on your own terms and then 
and then and then from there we'll see. Um, you know, I you know I think it's important that we have design choices where we can like um, have a little more say and that not everything be pre-programmed for us. That that would be very disappointing. <laughs> so, I mean, yep. the, the open web and encryption and Bitcoin, these are things that help uh, prevent social engineering and that prom pr promote more freedom and, yep. and more possibilities, honestly, and more entrepreneurship and more creativity and more scientific inquiry. I mean, think about the people who tried to shut down scientific inquiry 500, 600 years ago or whatever that were trying to say, um, you know, the earth was the center of everything and they were wrong, you know, and then, you know, all these conservative religious types throughout history have always said that, um, you know, there's no, no, no value in science and there's no value in technology and they've been wrong the whole time. So let's continue pushing here. Let's continue pushing. Laziness and, and, and ignorance, right? Like, so I would be lazy if I didn't, you know, take advantage of the internet, right? Someone in North Korea doesn't have the, option. They don't have the option. There's literally no way for them to access the internet. So there's kind of like um, social laziness that philosophers have warned about forever that we basically become sheep, okay? And then there's actual like brainwashing and censorship that's possible like by closing off your population and keeping them off like the internet, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think these are two very different concepts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, look, don't be a sheep. Okay. It's easy to be a sheep. No offense to sheep. And, and there's some practical things, man. Yes. Get on signal, start encrypting your messages, yeah. take control over your, your privacy. The media doesn't want you to, but check out Bitcoin. You can be your own bank. You can transact with people around the world and no one can stop you. This can put a, put a, put a stop to a lot of arbitrary power and a lot of human rights violations. Um, you know, don't use WeChat, uh, question more, uh, you know, yeah. research what's happening in Xinjiang. I mean, learn about what's happening in the genocide in that country. And let's think about how we can build our societies so that we never have that kind of power concentration ever again. This is the Lex Free Podcast.